The scripture reading this morning is found in Mark chapter 6, verses 34 through 42. However, my reading will not match the screen. I will be reading from the message. So they got in the boat and went off to a remote place by themselves. Someone saw them going, and the word got around. From the surrounding towns, people went out on foot, running, and got there ahead of them. When Jesus arrived, he saw this huge crowd. At the sight of them, his heart broke, like sheep with no shepherd they were. He went right to work teaching them. When his disciples thought, thought this had gone on long enough, it was now quite late in the day. They interrupted, we are a long way out in the country, and it's very late. Pronounce a benediction and send these folks off so they can get some supper. Jesus said, you do it. Fix supper for them. They replied, are you serious? You want us to go spend a fortune on food for their supper? But he was quite serious. How many loaves of bread do you have? Take an inventory. That didn't take long. Five, they said, plus two fish. Jesus got them all to sit down in groups of 50 or 100. They looked like a patchwork quilt of wildflowers spread out on green grass. He took the five loaves and two fish, lifted his face to heaven in prayer, blessed, broke, and gave the bread to his disciples. And the disciples, in turn, gave it to the people. He did the same with the fish. They all ate their fill. The disciples gathered 12 baskets of leftovers. More than 5,000 were at the supper. And now we will welcome Reverend Marion to speak. Good morning. It is a joy to be here with you and to have this opportunity to share with you a little bit about Give Ye Them to Eat. That's the mission in Mexico. I've been working with them since the year 2000. I've made, I've taken at least 25 teams down and I've been down, oh, about 30 times or so myself. I've lost track. It's too hard to, to count. The passage of scripture that Becky just read is where the mission gets its name. She read from the message, you prepare them supper. But in the King James Version, it says, give ye them to eat. In other translations, you feed them. This scripture was the basis of the ministry. Two things in that passage of scripture that Becky read jumps out at me. First, Jesus comes and he sees all the people and he has compassion on them. His heart breaks for them because they're like sheep without a shepherd. And so he teaches them and works with them and as the time comes that they're getting really hungry, and the disciples say, hey, we need to send these folks off so they can go to McDonald's and get some food. Of course, there were no McDonald's anywhere close, but you know, Jesus was going to send them off, or the disciples were. Jesus says, you feed them. You give them something to eat. Go and see what you have. They started with what the people had, took it to Jesus, and then Jesus blessed it, and it multiplied. The first year I went to Jiddy, which is how we abbreviate, G-Y-T-T-E, we call it Jiddy, makes it easier. The first year I went to Jiddy, I heard an old Chinese poem, go to the people, Live among them. Learn from them. Love them. 
Start with where they are. Build on what they have. And of the best leaders, when the work is done and the task is accomplished, the people will say, we have done it ourselves. The mission and ministry of Jitty is set in the rural areas of the state of Puebla. Next slide, please. It's a little hard to see, but there is a red spot right above my finger. That's the state of Puebla. The state of Puebla is south of Mexico City. I tell people it's where the country starts to get skinny. And it's about halfway between the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific Ocean. Next slide. This shows an enlargement of the state of Puebla, and this little dot right there is where the village of Tlanquapican is. Tlanqualpican, which means the place where many waters flow, or it can also be translated as place of scorpions. We didn't see too many of those, but we did see some. The mission was started in 1977, 43 years ago, by Terry and Muriel Henderson. They retired, uh, largely due to Muriel's health, about six years ago, maybe, something like that. And now uh, missionaries Nan and Miguel have come and they now lead the JITI program. Nan served as a missionary in Nicaragua for 30 some years. She met her husband Miguel in Nicaragua. He is Nicaraguan. And they have been a wonderful fit for the JITI program. They are general board, General Board of Missions Missionaries, <clears throat> say that three times fast, and they are supported through Global Missions, and I know that they thank you for your support. As a matter of fact, I was on a Zoom with them on Friday, and Nana Miguel sent their greetings to the churches and a special greeting to those uh, who have come down. So they send their love to all of you. The program has a number of different areas. They work in livestock development, community development, community health, the AWARE program that we participated in, which is an alternative work and study reality experience, and I'm missing one, agriculture, livestock, health, those are the main ones. The other one is just a little thing. The training center was built by volunteers. The dormitories we stayed in, the buildings we met in. And what they do is they start with what the people have. Jesus said, go see what they have. Go see what's available. We do a lot of building with mud and straw. Sometimes the buildings are made of straw bales where we have rebar and you kind of impale the bales over the rebar and then cover it with a mud and straw mixture. Or the type of building that we did when we were there, uh, we were using a method called compacted earth where we had a form, we scattered the straw mix some mud, I was one of the chief mud mixers, and throw buckets of the mud, get the straw all wet and gooey, stuff it down in, and tamp it until it hard, and then it will harden and be a very firm wall. It's ecological, it's good insulation, it's lovely. So we're gonna go to the next picture. This is our group with our Mexican friends you may see some familiar faces there. 
Um, the detail's not real great, but I know Becky has some pictures in the back. Um, that was our last day when we had our party, our official picture, which is always a great deal of fun. One of the important things about the mission is that when we are there, we work together with Mexicans. We don't come down and work for them. We work with them. And we build relationships with them. We get to hear about their families and we get to learn their stories. And in 20 years, I've watched them grow up. Um, it's been an amazing journey. Uh, the young man standing beside Ray with his hat on a little crooked. Uh, I knew him when he was about four years old. So I have literally watched them grow up. Next slide. This is the house that our team was working on. In 2017, there was a bad earthquake in Mexico. It was a 7.2. And the epicenter was where our training center is. It was literally the epicenter of the, the earthquake. And so many people lost their houses. We've been helping to rebuild. And we're using the outer walls here are made of that compacted earth. In another picture, you'll see what it looks like when it's not covered. And the styrofoam sheets with with the fence wire, those will be the interior walls. And they were then covered with, with a light cement mixture uh, to give it a good, good finish. It doesn't take up as much room inside. The compacted earth walls are maybe eight inches, and those are about four, so you, you save a little bit of inside space by doing the walls that way. Next slide. That's the mother who is now living in the house with her husband and her two kids, and I cannot remember her name. And neither does Becky. <laughs> but she and the children and the husband also helped when they were around and, and able to. Uh, she helped us mix mud and do some cementing. When the group from here came home, at the end of their time, I stayed for two more weeks. And I got to go back and help work on the house a little more, which is how I got these pictures. Next picture. Uh, here you can see the interior is, is getting done. A um, couple of windows in the house. You'll notice the roof has a space between the roof and the walls. It's hot down there. It's a tropical climate, and air circulation is important. So, And they don't have screens on windows, so there's no screens up there. Bugs are just part of life. Next slide. That's our mason, whose name is Ray, and he was working on covering. You can see the walls now that they've they've dried, they've got, you can see the straw, but that is very hard and solid. In the earthquake, the buildings at the Tree of Life Center that are made this way and out of the straw bales, not one of them collapsed. Some of them, the cement covering cracked, so you peeled it off and you put some more cement up but none of the buildings collapsed. Uh, the ones with straw bales, my joke is, and, and some of you who are old enough to remember Weebles, remember Weebles wobble? Wee bales wobble, but we don't fall down. The straw bales. Uh, so that's, uh, Ray was finishing up the inside, and our next slide. One of the reasons I stayed down was to go through a week 
with the women who take the health courses. There's a wonderful part of the program where women from villages all over the state of Puebla are invited to come, and they come for three one-week training sessions over an 18-month period. And they learn to be health promoters in their own communities. They learn basic sanitation. They learn to build dry composting toilets. They learn dental hygiene. They learn about nutrition. They learn about prenatal care. They learn first aid. They learn about diabetes. They learn so many things. Um, and then when they go back to their villages, they have supplies and teaching aids and they will go into their elementary schools and teach a program on dental hygiene. They may go to a United Methodist women's group and teach a session on menopause because many of the villages don't have doctors, don't have nurses, and don't have a high level of education. And so people simply don't know some of these things that, that we consider basic stuff I learned in health class in school and, and growing up. Uh, here, they're learning to give injections. They're practicing on oranges, and they actually practiced on each other. And they weren't giving shots in the arms. Diabetes has become a major problem in Mexico. And some people need our health promoters to give injections. Or the doctor may prescribe an antibiotic that has to be given by injection. And so they'll go and, and get the prescription. They'll get the, the syringe and they'll bring it to the health promoter who will then give them the injection. The figures that we saw the other day is that during the 2018-2019 annual conference year, the health promoters between workshops and doing first aid and injections and other things that they do minister to over 12,000 people. We have about 140 health care workers now who are all over the state and that figure is underreported. Not all the women fill out their reports. So talk about multiplying loaves and fishes. A little bit of education here, and it goes out and touches thousands and thousands of people. One of the things that I found very exciting, a family that we built a home for the year before two of the women in that family took part in this health course and they will become health promoters. It's enabled some people to get jobs because of the knowledge they have. They, they may work for a doctor or they may find a job in a clinic someplace. So it's really been a, a marvelous blessing. It's one of my, my favorite parts of the program. Um, all the parts are important and all the parts do good, but this one just catches my heart because it has improved the health of villages. Uh, you, you teach a village about sanitation, just simply washing their hands and disinfecting their fruits and vegetables, and you have improved their health. And if you get them to not eat germs, then the food they eat, stay, their nutrition stays with them. You improve nutrition if you're healthy. Next slide. They also teach them about medicinal herbs and remedies. We have a woman in this particular group from the northern part of Puebla who's part of an indigenous tribe. Spanish is her second language. She speaks Nahuatl. But she has this wealth of knowledge of medicinal plants passed on from her grandmother. And so she was sharing with us that particular night, if you'll go to the next slide, 
we were tearing apart different herbs and things, boiling them, straining them, adding them to a Vaseline base, and making all these wonderful uh, rubs. One, it, it was like kind of a, an asper cream rub, a rub that's good for arthritis, and there were others that were good for your skin, and it was, it was fun. It was great fun. Next slide. This is just a, a very pretty picture of the sorghum fields. The area that Tlanquapican is in has good volcanic soil. It's got rich soil, but they only have five months of rain. It rains from May to about mid-October. And then it doesn't rain at all from mid to late October until May. So you've got a sh relatively short growing season. It's very rocky, it's very hilly, so you're limited as to what can be grown there. It's not like our Midwest where you can plow fields for miles and miles. Uh, here, many of the local farmers still plow with, with a donkey. Um, but this is just one of the beautiful fields. There are still some active volcanoes in the area. Mount Popo is one. Every once in a while, Mount Popo gets excited and throws some ash or or some lava around. Um, sometimes it just smokes a lot. And most of the other mountains are um, extinct volcanoes. And this bird was sitting on one of the plants in that field, and I zoomed in on it just because I thought it was a cute little bird. And I, I like that picture, so I brought it. Uh, that's the end of the pictures. I didn't know how much uh, Becky and, and the group that came was a, have been able to share with you. Uh, if you go to Jitty's website, and all you have to remember is Jitty, G-Y-T-T-E, if you type in Jitty, it'll pop up. It's jitty.org. Um, one of the interesting things, uh, COVID has kind of shut things down as you you know, we've not been able to have any teams go to Mexico. There's a group from McVeigh Town in our conference that's considering their trip in January. They're going to meet in the next week or so to decide if they're going to go in January. But with COVID increasing, uh, at an alarming rate right now. Even if they decide today they're going to go, by January that may not be possible. So we have been hosting virtual mission trips. I'm now hosting my fourth virtual mission trip to Jitty. We do it by Zoom. It's open to anyone. I advertise it on my Facebook page. So, you know, Becky, if you ever see it and want to share it with everybody. Um, we have slide presentations. We Zoom with Nan and Miguel. Um, the names won't mean anything to you, but, but for Becky, Clara and Yvonne, who are both bilingual, join us. And they give some of the presentations. And one day, uh, Catalino and Sala Tiel come on from the farm, and if Estella's around, she pops in as well. I also get to see my godsons. I've been there long enough. I'm part of the family. Um, Gab Clara's youngest son, Gabrielle, is seven now, and he is doing a lot of his classes online, so he comes with her to the office, and uh, he popped in Friday morning to show me he lost another tooth. One of the stories 
of people's lives that has totally been transformed by Jitty is Estella. Estella was very shy, extremely, painfully shy. At, in her early 20s, she had never spent a night away from home. She lives in a village about 20 minutes from the Clan Kwapikon. She was working with children in, in a program in her village. And her pastor approached her about taking part in this health care program. She asked her father, and her father said, no, absolutely not. Estella was one of the youngest girls in the family. The others had all gone off and got married, and he was not letting Estella out of the house. Estella prayed about it and defied her father and told her father she was going to go whether he liked it or not. So she went, the first time she had ever stayed away from home. She was still extremely shy. When I first met Estella and you would talk to her, she usually kept her eyes down. But as she went through the program and began to participate in giving presentations at schools and with children, her self-confidence began to grow. And today, she teaches a lot of the courses for the health course. She teaches many of those classes. She has this bright, beautiful smile. She has dimples. And she just lights up the room. She is so knowledgeable, so confident. She works full time for Jitty. And she is really second in command at, at the Tree of Life. She gives tours to groups that come by. I've talked a lot about what we did and how we're affected, but the training center is open and they get a lot of groups from high schools, from middle schools, from colleges. The seminary in Mexico City requires their pastors to come spend a week at Jitty in order to graduate. Because many of them grew up in cities and will be assigned to rural areas, and they come and learn about dry composting toilets, they learn alternative building methods. They learn how to relate to the people and how to help people help themselves, which is really what this program does. The part, the, the one thing that I neglected when I was running through the parts of the program is the basis of everything. It's the spiritual development. Duh, Marion. They help provide teacher ed education classes for those who teach Sunday school. They provide worship material and material for VBS, Advent, Holy Week. And everything they do at the farm Every workshop they teach is started with a brief devotion. 85% of Mexico is Roman Catholic. And for many years, those who were not Roman Catholic, and, and th this is the terminology the Catholics use. The Catholics call themselves Catholics and those who go to church but are Protestants or independents are called Christians. Kind of odd, but you know, the Catholics were very suspicious of Christians. And Christians might face some persecution 
If you were the only Christian family in your village, people might not come to your store. Um, but that is beginning to disappear. But whether they're Catholic or Christian or, and, and like the United States, they have a lot of people who are Catholic or Christian in name only. They show up to church twice a year. And no different than us. But they start every program with, with devotions and they, they talk about how God is a part of everything that we do. When the first two women, they were young girls at the time, came to work for Terry and Muriel, these new Americans moved into town and they probably had money so they could hire people. So these two girls, Rosa and Veronica, knocked on Terry and Muriel's door and said, would you hire us? And Terry and Muriel said, we'll, we'll think about it. So they came back the next day and Terry and Muriel said, yes, we will give you jobs. And they said, okay, we'll tell the teacher that we're quitting school and we'll come work for you. And Terry and Muriel said, no, 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 no. If you quit school, we will not hire you. We will only hire you if you stay in school. So they agreed. And as they're walking, they turned around and said to, to Terry and Muriel, but you know, we're Catholics and we're not going to change. None of them are Catholics anymore. <laughs> Their lives have been changed. I've watched the village change. When I first went there, very few children in the village ever even thought about going on for higher education. Jitty provided scholarships for two young women. Both became pastors. Both of those pastors became district superintendents. And one of them is currently the bishop of the Southeast Annual Conference in Mexico, Bishop Raquel. A young girl from a remote village whose life was changed and now she has touched so many lives and I am blessed to call her my friend because I knew her before she was a bishop. And in Mexico, uh, it's an autonomous Methodist church and their system is that you can be elected bishop for one term, you can be reelected for a second term and each term is four years but after eight years, you stop being a bishop and you go back to being a regular pastor, which is kind of an interesting way of doing things. I could talk for three more hours, but I won't. You have been kind, you have been attentive, and I appreciate that very much.